In book three, we have a question that is worth pursuing for the sake of this class as we're studying beauty and holiness. Um, in Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot, one of the characters, a sick man, makes a claim. He says, beauty will save the world. So we have this idea of the salvificness of beauty that's in Dostoevsky's fiction. Um, can it save the world? Why or why not? And then the question becomes more complex in the Brothers Karamazov with Dmitri, who again is our romantic. He is with Alyosha and he's outside and he is going into ecstasies over poetry and reciting poetry. And, and yet one wonders what, what is happening, that he's bursting forth in sobs and raising his heads and exclaiming these, these poetic verses. What is he doing here? Well, on one side, if we look at Dimitri as representing what was going on in culture, we have a divide between the Enlightenment and the Romantics. And Dostoevsky was aware of this divide. If you read Notes from the Underground, which is one of his earlier novels, the character is very torn by whether to act like a hero in a novel and to be a romantic the way Dimitri is and everything to be about feelings and emotional and that's how we connect again the subjective and that's how we can understand ourselves in relationship to the world. Or on the other hand, to make everything objective and to be a rationalist and to program his behavior out and to act as society wants him to act, what is good, what is right, what is moral. And he feels that neither one of these things understand the full picture, which of course they don't. In Dostoevsky's work, they do not. You can't rationalist and enlightened, or sorry, rationalist enlightenment or this um, false poetic romanticism, neither one of them are understanding the whole, which of course would be the third option in which people uh, should have emotions that are rightly aligned with their reason and um, their will and their hearts and their minds all make up a human person and we are neither just one thing. And so Dimitri is feeling lost because he only lives in this romantic worldview and he's feeling very torn. He's feeling torn between his emotional response to things and his um, depraved sensualist character from his father. He said that he's an insect. He calls himself an insect and he says all Karamazovs are insects. He said the same insect that lives in me lives in you, Alyosha. You too have this Karamazian insectness, this sensuality that is, um, that is no more deserving than a bug, that we are really just parasites on other people and that that lives in both of us. And he also juxtaposes it between the ideal of the Madonna and the ideal of Sodom. So here we have the devil struggling with God and the battlefield is the human heart. And the struggle is over how to act and respond in the world. Um, do you lift up the beauty that draws you? Right? Do you understand beauty and its connection to holiness? when we think of the Madonna and the way that it draws us towards what's lasting and eternal and lovely? Or do we consume the beauty? Does the beauty draw out the worst in us? Um, our desires to please ourselves with it, Sodom, to use it and consume it. What are we going to do? Where does our will lie in that? Do we give in to our insect nature or do we move towards the angelic? Right? Um, do we follow the Madonna and be an angel, or do we become an insect and follow the ideal of Sodom? And again, it's the devil versus God. So we see these choices, and this has been since book one. The choice between Theodore and Zosima, the choice between the devil and God, the choice between Sodom and the Madonna. These are the choices in the novel, and this is being outlined for us as ways to align our will. In some sense, this goes all the way back to Plato's two-horsed chariot, that there's a move that, that will go upwards towards being, and there is a move that will take you downwards, uh, away from who you were meant to be. Also in book three, we are introduced a little bit to Grigory, Lizaveta, and Smirjikov. So I'd like to talk about who these characters are um, by looking at them more closely. Grigory is a second father to Dmitri for when Dmitri actually um, is neglected by his father. 
He is raised for a short time by Grigory, as is Yvonne and Alyosha, but for some reason, more than any other character, Dmitri understands Grigory to be more like his father. Grigory himself, him and his wife Marfa, they lose a child, and um, they are the servants of Fyodor, and they inherit Fyodor's last son, Smirchikov, who is a, um, a bastard son in the sense that he is born with, without a father being named. Um, from a holy fool, Lizaveta. So here we have an actual holy fool. And the reason that she is known as a holy fool of God is that she is running around as an ascetic. She is pious. Um, it says in, about Lizaveta that uh, she's dearer as an orphan to all the pious people in town. Everyone liked her. Even the boys did not tease her or insult her. She would walk into strangers' houses and no one would turn her out and everyone was nice to her. When she was given a kopeck, she would accept it at once and take it and put it in the box in the church or in the prison. When she was given a roll in the marketplace, she went and gave this roll to the first child that she met. She herself lived only on black bread and water. She would sometimes sit in front of an expensive shop, and the owners were never wary of her. They knew that even if someone put thousands down and forgot them, she would never take a kopeck. So here she is. She is a woman that everyone regards as holy and yet she becomes pregnant. She climbs into Theodore's garden and gives birth. In some ways, people saw this as her naming the father, that Theodore is the horrible person who raped a holy fool. This is like desecrating an incarnate icon. This is one of the worst things that Theodore could have done in the novel, is to uh, rape this woman. And Grigory saves the child. Lizaveta dies. And Grigory says, God's orphan child is everyone's kin, all the more so for you and me, talking to Marfa. Our little one who has died has sent us this new one who was born of the devil's son and a righteous woman. Weep no more. So he and Marfa bring up this baby who they then refer to as a dragon or a beast. And um, he has his own problems. Uh, Smirjakov doesn't, is not neither, he's neither just evil nor good. In the same way that all of the Karamazovs seem to have these base desires as well as these holy drives or these passionate loves, um, so too do we have Smirjakov. Smirjakov even, um, at one point when, when they describe him, they say that he was fond of hanging cats and then burying them with great ceremony. He would put on a sheet which served as a vestment chant and swing something over the dead cat as if it were a censer. But this was all done and the sly as in great secrecy. So he's both monstrous in that he hangs cats. And then on the other side, he pretends to be a priest to bury them. So we have the division within Smirjikov, um, his holy fool mother and his devilish father who raped her. And here is Smirjikov. Here is the, the fruit of that. So we have a character who is really undecided as well. And he has both good and evil in them, in the extreme in him. I think that I think the picture of, of the hanging cats and then burying them gives us the, the greatest paradox of his character. 